Now, 16 minutes after 8 o'clock this morning, at least one in seven children has experienced child abuse or neglect in the past year here in the United States, according to the CDC. 1,750 died as a result in 2020. Uh, rates of child abuse and neglect are five times higher for children in families with low socioeconomic status. And oftentimes there are warning signs. We want to help you spot them as we mark Child Abuse Prevention Month. Dr. Randy Alexander, Professor and Chief of the Division of Child Protection and Forensic Pediatrics with UF Health, joins us now live via Zoom this morning. Good morning. Thank you for being with us, Doc. Good morning. So sadly, as we know, abuse happens at any age. So let's break down the warning signs if we could, starting with specifically children who, quite frankly, are just too young to explain what's happening to them because they're not yet speaking. We're talking about infants and toddlers. What are the most common injuries that you and your team see? Well, you know, the most common things we see is neglect uh, by far. About two thirds of things are neglect. About two thirds of deaths are neglect. Um, those injuries we worry about is the unsafe sleep, you know, where somebody's in bed with a sleeping with a child, and that can be a disaster sometimes. Um, or toddlers, when they can get to swimming pools and drown, uh, are big concerns. But when it's physical abuse, um, when a child's not cruising yet, you know, where they're holding on to something, walking around, they shouldn't have bruises. And yes, accidents happen every once in a while, but for the most part, they don't have bruises. So if you're a caregiver, um, you're a relative or something, and you see a child that is having bruises, that should be looked into, you know, what exactly is going on? Um, it's different when you get toddlers and preschoolers and everything. They're out exploring the world and they're bumping into things and they get bruises, but they don't get pattern bruises. And so that would be a, another warning sign. And I, I know that as, as a member of CPT, you and your team examine these kids when they are admitted to the hospital. And, and, and often, you know, DCF interviews, obviously, the, the parent or caregiver involved. What reasons typically are given as triggers for abuse, particularly among infants and, and, and young, young children? Well, so for the kids that are infants, um, it's the crying is a big frustration. That's when we see the shaken baby syndrome, um, but we might see broken bones, people that can't cope with crying. And of course, you have an infant, they cry. That is their job, it seems. And some of them are extraordinarily good at doing their job. Um, so that's the trigger there. When we look at kids that are uh, older, say a, a year, two years old, um, that's when the, we start seeing burns where a child has a toileting accident, somebody has a, a misunderstanding of what normal development is, and they think the kids should be able to do things they can't do yet. Mm. They're mad, they're near hot water, they burn them. Oh, it's terrible to even think about it. So how do you prevent this? And, and let's let's focus again on these infants and, the, and these young kids, because as you mentioned, you know, infants cry. Uh, is there any harm in just putting them in their crib and letting them cry if you're feeling like you're overwhelmed and, and might do something that you, you shouldn't? Oh, not at all. I'm, I mean, put them down for five minutes, walk away, uh, take a breather. What's happening in your body is your adrenaline levels go down by half every 90 seconds. So what you're doing is you're giving yourself a time out. Um, and when the baby is still going to be a baby, whether crying or not, but you at least can control yourself better. Um, don't walk away completely, but, you know, take a break or have someone else come in. That's really good. And you take a break. And what about older children, children who are now in school? <clears throat> Your message to teachers and other caregivers in terms of warning signs that that child may be abused physically? Yeah, so um, when they get older, one of the things is that sometimes people talk, whether it's siblings or someone else. When the kids get a little older, they can start to talk about these things. Um, and particularly with, with young kids, they, uh, they have a tendency to tell us things. Uh, where older kids might disguise it in some ways because of embarrassment. Um, it's not such an issue with younger kids. Believe the kids, listen to what they're saying. Um, and if they're saying things that are concerning, let's act on that and see where, where it takes us. It's not always going to be abuse, but what if it is? Yeah, the difference that you can make in that child's life. Dr. Alexander, thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate all of your knowledge in this, given what you have seen, certainly in, 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 as a doctor and also as a CPT director. Thank you.
Thank you. And let's prevent some child abuse this month and every month. I love that idea, which is why I want to pass along to you uh, an important phone number. If you or someone you know is the victim of child abuse, you can call 800-96-ABUSE. You can remain anonymous. So if you're a neighbor, do not worry about making this call. And you should know by making that call, you could be saving a child's life.